Welcome back to another edition of the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. I'm your host, Justin Mart. This week, we are diving into, I think, one of the most exciting topics in all of crypto. I'm going to go out and say it. Uh, the ownership economy. The idea that crypto can revolutionize how communities are formed and the way in which the early users and participants of a project can gain a sense of ownership and what that means, how that actually impacts their growth trajectory, and all the psychological effects of that as well. This is, I think, again, one of the more exciting topics in crypto, just because of how pervasive it is, as well as how big this is going to become. And it already is pretty big. So with me today, I've got Lee Jin. She is the co-founder and general partner at Variant, a crypto-focused fund that is, as it happens, focused on the ownership economy. So with that said, let's dive into it. Here we go. Would you, if you went back to school, would you actually get a stats degree again? No, I wouldn't. So, oh. okay, there's a longer story here, which is that I was forced to study math by my parents. Poor, poor my age. mother. <laughs> I was actually initially an English major. Wow, English that's very different. Yes, my mother told me so that I was bringing shame on the family. Not really at all in math and science. Well, I, I've always loved math. In school, I love math. Um, but I think if I had to like pick one, I'm much more of a creative left brain person. Hmm. Okay. That's an interesting combo because you have the math stats background, but you come from this creative sort of bend initially. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's funny when I look at like people that I, I guess some of the outliers in the crypto space, they have this like really bizarre combination of being incredibly articulate, very smart and creative. Like that combination is really rare. And I think it's actually like, if you're, if you're just so head smart, you end up like narrowing in on one little thing and you miss the forest for the trees. Right. Creativity lets you take a step out and look at the big shifts that are happening. Well, I think also in crypto, storytelling is such a powerful superpower Hmm. that, I mean, if you think about Vitalik versus all of the other layer one founders, I feel like the X factor that he had was his writing ability, his storytelling ability. Yeah. Because there's some other like really technical geniuses out there who haven't been able to get the same level of interest and adoption. And I, I think it does come down to his ability to tell compelling stories. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we, we both know that the winning protocols, teams, and projects doesn't come down to the ones that are technically superior. And in fact, the most technically superior ones honestly lose more often than not because they might be too skewed that direction and they miss out on the storytelling aspect, which is all about growth, user growth, retention, developing a community around it. Actually, this segues amazingly into our topic, <laughs> the yeah. ownership economy, right? So there's clearly a lot of other factors at play here. Um, but yeah, storytelling is super, super powerful. Um, so uh, yeah, we wanted to chat about the ownership economy. We wanted to chat about, I think the way that I frame this in my head is like, you know, crypto is this really fascinating journey about blockchain innovation, the things that blockchains actually innovate on and the way that they're impacting new products, new services. Um, and so my mental frame is like, look, in the early days, we had Bitcoin and that was blockchains innovating on money. Yeah. And then the Gen 2, Gen 3 shift is actually not necessarily about money or, or about economics, so to speak. It's more about actually communities and getting communities involved in projects and using blockchain sort of primitives and technology and infrastructure to reimagine how communities form, which is kind of this buzzword idea of the ownership economy of sorts, mm-hmm. right? So I know you've thought, you know, just you're, you're basically focused on this at variant. Yeah. Um, Am I right? Am I Yeah, am I close? that's right. <laughs> our, our entire thesis as a fund is what we call the ownership economy, which is the idea that crypto enables ownership to be distributed across the internet as seamlessly, as easily, as frictionlessly as we've been distributing information across the internet. And what is the implication of being able to send value much more frictionlessly? It's that ownership can actually mu- be distributed much more broadly than it has been historically. Historically, ownership has been confined to really this rarefied class of institutions and individuals who have special access, whether it's because they're accredited or they're working at a VC firm or whatever. But the idea of the ownership economy is that digital ownership is going to become a keystone of all types of new user experiences. And furthermore, that the winning internet products of the next era are going to be the ones that turn their users into owners. Yeah, there's so much to unpack here. Um, I'm a little bit excited because I don't really know the direction this is going to go, so to speak. Yeah. But um, I feel like a little bit of a kid in a candy shop because I don't know about you, but when I got involved in crypto, um, you know, everybody was excited about Bitcoin at the time. It was a long time ago. And I always looked at it and said, yeah, money's cool, but I'm more excited about 
the way you can transmit value. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, ownership of sorts, right? And the interesting new ways that would kind of unlock all this value. The analogy though of, hey, this is like how the internet makes it easy to transmit value across the globe or sorry, information across the globe. And now it's transmitting ownership. Yeah. So there's clearly going to be a lot of implications to this. So let's let's try to find one concrete example of the ownership economy. Uh, and I think there's a great one out there. It's the heal Helium Network. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe to set the stage real quick, just what this is, and we'll talk about how it's different from earlier models. But Helium is a long distance, um, low powered Wi-Fi network. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, suited for Internet of Things and, you know, a different sort of application. Um, and I think just to contrast this, if you wanted to create this long distance, low level, low, low bandwidth Wi-Fi network, and you're a single company, you would have to go get venture funding, raise a bunch of capital, deploy these networks in a bunch of cities, do all the work yourself, get all the supply going, and then try to find demand. Now, the interesting thing here about this specific example is that, well, we already have Wi-Fi networks everywhere. There's Wi-Fi hotspots in every home. Mm -hmm. What if we could just somehow incentivize people to turn their Wi-Fi networks, globally connect them somehow and flip them on like light switches, and boom, we've created our long distance, low bandwidth Wi-Fi network yeah. instead of recreating all that infrastructure. Yeah. And so the ownership economy comes in because, well, they can use a token for this, right? Yeah, exactly. So the, the way that this intersects with the ownership economy is that Helium has been able to bootstrap this network of the supply side of people contributing their hotspots to this network by incentivizing them with a token. And so as a participant, as a, as a supply side user, you're earning Helium tokens by virtue of contributing your hotspot to the network. Whereas previously, as mentioned, it would have been this like Herculean effort to get this network up and running. Like there's been many failed attempts to create peer-to-peer -peer, like mesh networks before, all of which haven't succeeded because they weren't able to overcome that initial cold start problem when the network doesn't actually have intrinsic utility. But by virtue of giving users ownership in the form of tokens early on, you can actually supplement the underlying utility of the network with this additional financial value, thereby compensating people and giving them this financial incentive to participate in advance of actually having the, yeah. the demand seated. I have a couple observations here. and Let me know what you think about these. Number one is in this example, it's pretty clearly somewhat of a financial incentive. You're getting tokens on the network. These tokens are required if you want to use the network for data purposes. So it's an ingrained token. And so if you believe the Helium network is valuable and there's going to be a lot of demand for it someday, well, having these tokens potentially means you get financial upside, right? right? They might also be governance tokens. So maybe you can, you know, I don't really know the direction Helium is going, but maybe there's that too. But I'm not sure if, like, I don't think it necessarily needs to be financial. Like the ownership economy is, as we talked about, is also governance, it's yes. also direction over communities, yes. right? And so, but what I'm hinting at is like, there's just a psychological hook somewhere yeah. of being an early user of a platform you care about. Yeah. And so people that do want to see these networks emerge, this is kind of a drag example of some Wi-Fi network, but if it's a different example of some, you know, community driven project or yeah. trying to like, you know, solve world hunger or something powerful and impactful, well, if you're really ingrained to that, that sort of mission, you can get in early, you can actually see some measure of influence and it just, That's your right. engagement just hooks, it gets right into you. you know? Yes. There's a lot of sexier examples <laughs> <laughs> out there that, um, that I could share as well, but precisely like, I, I think in this case, it's very clearly, you know, there's a financial reason to be in this network and that's what people are there for. But there's other instances out there, um, particularly in like more creative communities or creator economy networks, wherein users are, um, participating because they actually, they, they want to exercise their governance power. So a great example of this is um, a new Web3 dating show called Mad Realities. Oh, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> Let me hear about this one, Mad Realities. Mad Realities. Yeah. Mad Realities is this new Web3 interactive dating mm -hmm. show that was created by um, this amazing entrepreneur, Devin, who was one of the founders of the Clubhouse show, NYU Girls Roasting Tech Guys. I don't know this, but it sounds fascinating. Oh my fascinating. God, this was like a, a pivotal- <laughs> It was on Clubhouse though? It was on Clubhouse okay. during the pandemic and it was like this iconic show um, that I went on once anyway so it was <laughs> story time yes it was focused on a uh, yeah like dating and and she eventually um took that idea and, and the learnings from it and created mad realities and so mad realities was bootstrapped through a crowdfund on mirror which hmm. is this web3 crowdfunding and publishing platform and she raised money for mad realities by selling nft roses hmm. um, so these are images of roses they come in different colorways and they conferred different governance powers to their holders. 
So um, some of these governance powers included being able to cast your own friend in the show. So okay. if, you, wow. if you bought one of these Good roses, hook. you could make your friend part of the show. Or there was another um, uh, another be benefit that you could get where um, one of the contestants would have to use a pickup line that you created. Do you buy these NFTs or are they handed out as being part of the you show? Bought or them. You bought, you bought them. You bought okay. them. Okay. Yep, yep. And so it had this, I think it's a really fascinating of what next gen entertainment looks like because it bootstrapped um, both funding as well as an initial audience for this show via tokens. Yeah. In well, advance of the actual content itself existing. Like prior to this model, prior to crypto, the way that you would have done the show is like, first try to pitch this to a bunch of movie or television studios, raise funding for it, get the, the pilot funded, then lose creative control and not have your audience participate or have any yeah. sort of say in the direction of this, um, of this, of this content. But she really flipped the script. No kidding. Well, I think it's such a powerful example too. I mean, we just talked about the dry example of a long distance, low latency Wi-Fi network. And okay, a little bit boring, but we can see the model, right? Yeah. You just give, you know, ownership, so to speak, on that network. This is much different because ownership's actually being redefined here. Yes. In this case, it's not really the financial upside. There probably might be some element of this if this takes off, the NFTs are powerful, but really it's, yo, you get to put your friend on the show. Yes. You get to like impact their dating life and like, you know, be a good friend and like, you know, be part of the governance of this platform. Ownership itself is shifting. Correct. Yeah. And that's what we mean when we say that ownership is really a spectrum of different experiences mm. because in the mad realities example, ownership means having the power to influence the narrative, the, the cast, the storyline of the show. And from, from what I've heard, like the token holders, the NFT holders of these roses actually want more places where they can dictate, you know, certain choices that are made or have more influence over the show. People are really actively participating in governance in a way that we rarely see in, you know, more financial use cases. Yeah. This is actually such a cool example, too, because you can also reason about some of the trade-offs. Like a dating network, you know, a dating app, obviously it's it's a marketplace, but you kind of need to see both sides of its supply and demand to get it going. And the experience has always been roughly the same. In this case, they're changing the experience. You have mm -hmm. more embedded ownership over the platform, the direction it takes, getting your friends on it, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you still kind of need to get that supply and demand going. And so there's a question in my head around, okay, well, we tried this new model. Maybe there are some trade-offs. Because mm -hmm. maybe your friend doesn't want to go on the show, or maybe like, maybe, you know, if you let certain people dictate who gets on it, there's like downsides to that too. And so I think my frame on this is, and tell me if you like this or not, but it's like, what an awesome experiment, but we're probably still in the experiment phase because they might run into some trade-offs that we didn't see before. And we'll take some learnings from that kind of the, you know, yeah. collect the data and then analyze it and see, you know, what the effect of it is yeah. type of model. Um, and, you know, take the learnings and, and try it again. Right. Yes. Or if this one takes off, then it takes off and you just deal with the trade-offs as they come. Yeah, absolutely. One of the key takeaways from our ownership economy report is that just giving users ownership in the form of a token is not a silver bullet for network success yeah. or ongoing health. There's plenty of examples out there where hmm. the non-token version of a network is actually outperforming the version that has a token. Um, or where token incentives may be boosted very short-term user growth. It was a, a one-time growth hack, yeah. basically. And after that, it sort of petered out. And so I, I, I completely agree that ownership is, it's not going to be a cure-all for um, these types of networks, but it is another really powerful tool in the toolkit, which you can harness in all of these new ways to enfranchise and empower your communities. But I think the best practices are still very emergent. Yeah, maybe, maybe to make a bold statement here, if your token, if all your token does is provide short-term financial upside, you actually attract the speculators rather than the long-term users. And these people are just people that go to different protocols, projects, extract all the short-term value and then completely leave. Mm -hmm. So you need to have some, if you're you know, developing a, a Web3 new native app that taps into the ownership economy, you gotta have some enduring value. You can't just give away money or all these people are going to come in, take it and leave. And you're left much worse than you were before. No money, no users. Right? That's right. At the same time, I don't want to discount speculation as a really powerful new force. Like, I think a lot of us got into crypto probably through the financial lens. We bought tokens at one point in time. Yeah. And then during a bull market, that token saw a lot of price activity and people are like, what is this thing? What is the underlying yeah. technology? Let mm -hmm. me look into this. And so I think speculation is you know, this phenomenon that gets a, a really bad rap, 
but unjustly because I think, I mean, we live in a world in which we all have to earn income. And so speculation is definitely a motivation, a core driver of behavior. But I think the question is, can you turn those Mm. speculators into your true fans later on? Yeah. And get them to really participate and be an enduring part of the network. Maybe one frame on this is like crypto helps you dream. Because, <laughs> yeah, we get involved in this and we see the potential of it. We can tell how how big the ownership economy is going to become. And so, of course, you want to kind of participate in these new models and check it out and see how it goes, especially if you care about that platform or that cause. Um, and that, in a sense, is like dreaming, but dreaming with like actual skin in the game. Yes. So it's really powerful. I want to note one thing, too, right? Like what I've seen is, OK, if you compare... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm make an example to a, a common Web2 product and a, sus, a subscription model, mm-hmm. right? So common Web2 products, you buy a subscription to the service. They give you discounted fees, some, you know, some perks or whatever. You have their service for a while and you pay a monthly fee. Well, the ownership economy version of this, tell me if you feel this is good or not, is like, hey, get some of these tokens and stake them. Basically, yeah. lock them up for a period of time. And the act of doing so, it's funny because there's no revenue component that doesn't drive revenue to the protocol. There's not, there's not really an exchange of value. You're taking coins out of circulation, so there's some financial impact there. But what I notice what happens is like, yeah, it does take coins out of circulation, so there's that financial upside. But it also turns those participants into fervent believers. Mm-hmm. They become defenders of the protocol. They feel like insiders. Yeah. And they're ready to defend the platform. There's this weird thing in psychology where it's like, if you want to believe something, you can find a way to believe it. You can believe whatever narrative you want if you're motivated to believe that narrative. And if you're not motivated to believe the narrative, or you know, if, if you think that actually a company's evil, well, you can find any reason to believe they're evil. But if you turn your customers into ardent supporters, you're turning them into people that find reasons to believe that you are, your thing is going to be the most amazing thing in the world. And you just turn the tide completely. It's, it's a weird hook, but like it really works. And that's the thing that matters is that fervent community, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree. I think it's, I mean, we have this uh, um, belief that ownership is going to create more new, like net new networks that had never previously existed. And they're going to kind of bifurcate on two sides of the spectrum. One is like networks that are much bigger than anything we've seen before. So if you think about something like Facebook, which is a social network of people, there's now, I think, 3 billion monthly active users of Facebook. That's that's staggering. But it's gotten there without any incentive alignment with the participants, any sort of economic incentive alignment. And so we just imagine if you layer on ownership as this added incentive where users actually have skin in the game in in Facebook success, well, that could actually arise in a network that gets even bigger, even more powerful than what we currently see today, than Facebook's of the world. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, we think that ownership is also going to enable new networks that were previously too small or not viable to exist. Yeah. And so huh. what does that look like? Um, an example would be previously, it, it used to be really difficult to set up an investment fund. You had to register and get your entity set up in Delaware or whatever. There were upfront legal costs. It probably cost, you know, a few hundred thousands of dollars to start a new venture fund. Well, now people are pulling their capital into on-chain entities and deploying funds together, perhaps with their friends or with other experts and creating entirely on-chain funds for sub $200. Hmm. And so this creates new investing networks or investment clubs, as we call them, that previously just would never have existed because of the friction of being able to participate. And so on both sides of the spectrum, you have new networks that are smaller, couldn't have viably existed before, and then much bigger networks than anything we've seen exist in. Yeah. So there's two things that I'm picking up here, right? Number one is just the idea of changing the definition of ownership and making it native to the internet, native to blockchain rails, integrated with different protocol services, that changes the game from a user growth perspective, a user's engagement perspective, right? And all these powerful things we talked about. The other dimension is, well, actually, it's just a new primitive to begin with. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, again, this idea of like trying to picture in your head, how does, uh, what are the new net new ways we can like ownership can can enable new products and services, and one of them is, hey, we can we can distribute, we can kind of disrupt investment funds because now all that rig, all that like challenging red tape and paperwork goes away. Poof, you could do it right away, right? And I imagine I imagine there's got to be many other examples that are going to come forth just because we've changed the nature of the game entirely. Completely, like I think Mad Reality is going back to that example. That is an example of like 
a show that could not have possibly existed in the pre crypto world. Like there was, there was no way for audiences to participate at that level. Um, and also to have an incentive to like crowdfund this entirely new show. Um, but that incentive alignment through the existence of those NFTs serves both to initially like generate the interest in funding this thing and bringing it into existence, but also creates this built in base of an audience that is then really bought into your success and wants to contribute to the entertainment factor. Of yeah. Show. You know, what's great. I, I, I feel like I hit on this a lot in the podcast and why I like the podcast, because I get to talk about crypto and it reminds me of like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. It's just like, you know, you, you talk about these things and you just get the sense of excitement. Like we're changing the game in a lot of different ways. I think the correct frame again is like, look, it's experimentation. There are going to be some trade-offs. You can talk about the trade-offs, right? There's going to be some challenges, but it's fundamentally net new things that we can create and explore. Mm -hmm. And look at all the awesome ways that it's already delivering a ton of value. Look at how big it's potentially become. Isn't crypto so exciting? Yeah. <laughs> I keep hitting back to this point, but I just, I love it because it brings out like what we're really doing in this space. It's not just about getting rich quick or whatever else. It's that we're actually changing the game in some real powerful ways, enabling new services. Yes. Yep. Yes, completely. I mean, that is why I was drawn to crypto in the first place. Yeah. I'm, Same here. I'm probably one of those very weird people who's <laughs> like get rich quick. That's that's yeah. not interesting to me. <laughs> I'm much more interested in like building a cooler, fairer internet. Yeah. That is full of new experiences that couldn't have existed before. So I don't want to pay at lip service. I actually do want to spend a minute or two talking about this. What are the downsides? To the ownership economy. Yeah. What are the trade-offs we're actually like? I, it's not going to be all. It's not going to be panacea, right? So, is there anything in your mind that's like, oh, this is a big challenge we have to work through? Um. Yeah. There's definitely a lot. Um. It's it's not like wow, we can give people ownership and and the world is immediately so much better. Like I think we are currently operating at a very special moment in time where you know recently we actually just had this example last week of a lot of people losing large sums of money through a token that conferred ownership over um, this network. I'm, I'm referring to Luna um, <laughs> and UST. And so, you know, you have to dig deeper into like, what are people actually owning? Is, is this thing going to have sustainable value? And I think there's going to be many instances in which users perhaps get disappointed yeah. in, you know, the ultimate value that they're holding. Um, and things aren't going to perform as well as they had been messaged to. And, and there's going to be a lot of disappointment and loss along the way. I think the other... Yeah, can I can I just... Yeah, so, of course. So for, for two reasons, right? Number one is I think there are founders with good intentions that are trying to do something new and innovative, but we the model might prove to be incorrect, mm -hmm. right? And there's varying degrees of this, right? Shades of gray. And we could d debate and discuss how certain protocols landed in this camp and where they are on the spectrum. But nevertheless, legitimate people trying to do something new, but it turns out, ooh, we just you know, design the protocol incorrectly, or there was a flaw over here, this thing happened, whatever, right? There's the second element too, that's just people that are value extractionary. Yeah. And they don't come in with the right intentions that definitely exists in the space yes. too. I think my important frame here is like, we should expect both to exist because the psychological hooks behind ownership are powerful. Yes. And it is challenging for people that are relatively new to the space to look at projects and differentiate between the two. Yeah. You kind of have to be, you know, you have to have some measure of comfort in looking at these protocols, seeing what the differences are. You have to make judgment calls on the founders, you know, intentions, right. et cetera, et cetera. So it can be a little bit challenging. And that's again, where there might be some, you know, some scary moments. And, you know, it's also why we always stress this is experimental and you probably should have a correct frame that it's likely these things fail, most of them fail in the long run, just because there's so many ways it can go wrong, whether they're well-intentioned or not. Um, but that that's certainly something we need to we need to like call attention to that it's exactly. not a, not a, not a for sure thing. Yeah. yeah, and you know, there's a, another example is like there's a ton of PFP communities that have just been basically abandoned. They they had an initial mint that did very. Yeah, sorry. PFP is a NFT project, yes. profile picture project. Yeah. Profile picture project. You know, the ten thousand PFPs that are minted and sold. I mean, there's been a whole wave of those over the last year. Um, a whole craze around these profile picture projects, um, NFTs, wherein a lot of those founders, perhaps, I, I, I don't know about their intentions, but some of these communities have essentially been abandoned and no longer are resourced and have initially messaged lots of lofty goals and um, very ambitious roadmaps that got a lot of people to buy in. Yeah. And 
that is going to represent, you know, a lot of disappointment to, to folks. So I think what I want to say is like ownership per se is not necessarily valuable. You have to dig deeper into like, what am I actually owning? Yeah. What is like, the form of ownership? Exactly. What is yeah. the form of ownership? What am I holding onto? Um, who is the team behind this? Like, are they actually committed to building this out for the long term? Um, and so really thinking about like what it is that that folks are investing in. And then I think the other potentially negative impact of ownership is actually on the on the creator side, whether the creator is like a founder of a project or who we think of as traditionally a creator, like a an artistic creator who's creating like an NFT project or some sort of social token. I think there's like perverse um, mental effects that could come in through this new financially incentivized model um, via crypto that had previously not existed. So to give you an example of this, um, I think a lot of creators have been, um, have had a lot of hesitance with regards to issuing their own social token because they don't actually want to have a financial measure of their success in real time, 24 seven, that will be live for literally the rest of their lives. And social token is like if I released Justin Coin. Yes. And I somehow ascribed value to it by either promising, you know, some future, you know, part of my paycheck goes to the token holders or something, or just you can connect with me and interact with me in certain ways. Yeah. That's a, that, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. These are, these are fungible tokens that are essentially issued by a single creator and they, um, they freely trade and they're liquid. And sometimes they have benefits that are conferred to the token holders. Other times they're just kind of like a, a reflection of yeah. perceived success or popularity. I think they they can have lots of mental health impacts on the people who issue them because it's this real time numerical quantitative reflection of yeah. your perceived popularity. And your reputation is wrapped up in it too. You exactly. Know? You, you can't necessarily walk away from it or, you know. Exactly. That's and so if we play this out for a few years, I think of all of the creators who've created NFTs, who've sold them, and you know, those prices will will always exist on the secondary markets. And as the prices go up and down, that could definitely affect them because they have they're not only responsible for their own success anymore, but they have this base of shareholders, stakeholders whose financial success is dependent on them. And that's a level of pressure and um, skin in the game that has not existed before. And I think it can have both positive effects yeah. in terms of incentivizing co-creation and communities to be much more um, participatory and involved, but it can also have negative effects in terms yeah. of anxiety and mental health. I, I do like the frame of bringing balance to this discussion because you know I think honestly in crypto, there's, there's a an incentive to just look through things with rose colored glasses and only mm -hmm. highlight the positive impacts. Yeah. It's really important to pay attention to in my head, like, look, this is a new toolkit. We got new tools in the toolbox and we can build new things with the new tools, but things are going to be built incorrectly to start with, or there's going to be bad effects too. And we can't expect things to be perfect out of the gate. In fact, yes. it's probably gonna be more rocky than we expect. Yes. And maybe one of the reasons why crypto falls a bunch of cycles of up and down, right? Is well, that's macro, the effects kind of taking shape. But you know the long term frame here is that long term it bends up and to the right mm -hmm. because I think the new tools are going to be really powerful to some degree, but we have to learn on our path there. Yeah. So, so important to be you know very thoughtful about all the ways it's going to impact yeah. people. Um, and, and I yeah. I recently wrote a post about this topic as yeah. well. It, um, it's it's published in Harvard Business Review, um, and it's called Web Three is our chance to build a better internet. Okay, in the Harvard Business Review, and you actually did an academic study on this. Washington, Harvard. <laughs> I'm assuming it was the most rigorous of most rigorous things. I have spent the last 12 months writing this piece, so I hope people check oh, wow. it out. Yeah. But basically, it's about, you know, we often talk about Web3 as an opportunity to build a fair internet, an internet that is owned by its users. But how do we define fairness? What does fairness look like? And how can we actually ensure that networks are being built that align with that vision of fairness? Because as we've mentioned throughout this show this conversation there are there are ways to build networks in which just speculators get rewarded or in yeah. which a lot of people can lose a tremendous sum of money um you can build networks that are very imbalanced that don't sustain themselves um that don't have um ongoing retention and so if web3 is our chance to build a, a fair or a better internet then how do we actually do that yeah. Um, what are the principles that we need to abide by to 
to create that foundation. Yeah. So clearly the rabbit hole goes very deep. This is yes. honestly <laughs> such a fascinating conversation because we could talk for hours about all the different ways this actually bubbles up into these projects, building things, what the trade-offs are. But um, what, a, what, a, what a great discussion. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks again for tuning in to another edition of the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. Really curious what you guys think about this one. The ownership economy, the rabbit hole goes very, very deep. We scratched the surface in a lot of ways. Hopefully you left with more than you came here with. But if you didn't, tweet at me. Let me know what questions you still have. As well as shoot us a like and a follow wherever you listen to podcasts. And as always, catch us on the web, coinbase.com slash around the block. We've got past podcast episodes, long form research, a bunch of other stuff for you. But until next week, goodbye. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 